Sure. Turn it over to Nadia. So our, our second speaker uh, for today's Grand Rounds is Dr. Nadia Dimitrova. And Nadia is a uh, assistant professor of molecular, cellular, and developmental biology at, at Yale. Um, and uh, she's actually doing uh, considerably important work in understanding uh, really this important area of, non, of the non-coding space of our genome. And uh, having received her uh, PhD at Rockefeller, she's uh, joined the, she had joined the uh, faculty at Yale. Her laboratory is focused on long non-coding RNAs. And uh, she's going to speak to us today about uh, the impact of these things in cancer biology. So, Nadja, thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, for tuning in um, to the Grand Rounds today. And so, uh, being isolated at home, um, I have... Um, uh, rediscovered the joy of keeping up with TV programs such as the inspiring news documentary by Ken Burns called The Gene, which aired on PBS a couple of weeks ago. And in this beautiful snapshot from the documentary, Burns illustrates the striking observation that protein encoding sequences comprise only a minor fraction, about 1-2% to of human genome, and are thus unlikely all by themselves to account for organismal complexity. Instead, they are surrounded by a wealth of regulatory sequences which are there to modulate gene expression, to determine if a gene is on or off, uh, when it becomes expressed in what cells and to what extent. And in the textbook view of the gene, we often think of these regulatory functions being fulfilled by specific DNA elements such as enhancers or promoters, but it may be worthwhile to consider uh, how non-coding RNAs might be contributing to this regulatory landscape. And when we think about these functions, we're stepping into the realms of long non-coding RNAs. So long non-coding RNAs are a class of RNAs with a very simple definition. They're non-coding transcripts longer than 200 nucleotides. They are pervasively transcribed in mammalian genomes, both from intergenic regions, as well as from regions that overlap protein coding units. There's hundreds of thousands of long non-coding RNAs that have been identified in the human genome. And on the surface, long non-coding RNAs generally uh, resemble mRNAs in that they're often spliced, capped, polyadenylated, but they're generally speaking uh, poorly conserved and not very well characterized. And while it may be easy to imagine that these transcripts might be simply transcriptional noise, Mounting data indicate that at least some of them, a subset of them, uh, are of functional significance in health and disease states. And so my lab investigates the roles of long non-coding RNAs in the regulation of gene expression in cancer-relevant pathways. And so our interests lie at the intersection of tumor biology and the biology of long non-coding RNAs. And to date, there is some evidence that long non-coding RNAs might be implicated in cancer. Uh, first and foremost, researchers have observed altered expression of many long non-coding RNAs in cancer. Secondly, uh, genome-wide association studies have revealed that um, cancer susceptibility frequently uh, is associated with non-coding regions. Uh, but I'll be the first one to tell you that uh, these observations are largely correlative. That is to say, they suggest that while genetic and epigenetic alterations of long non-coding RNAs may correlate with cancer type or stage or patient prognosis and make long non-coding RNAs potentially useful as biomarkers, that does not necessarily mean that the long non-coding RNAs themselves play functional roles. After all, um, altered expression might be due to different tissue or cell origins of cancer or due to global gene expression deregulation. Um, on the other hand, GWAS studies may represent mutations in regulatory regions, such as enhancers, rather than in long non-coding RNAs, or could be an inadvertent consequence of the general genomic instability in cancer. And so to get at whether alterations of long non-coding RNAs are causes, rather than mere consequences of cancer, basically whether they are drivers rather than passengers uh, in cancer, my lab has been focused on two main areas. 
First of all, how do we identify functional long non-coding RNAs in cancer, uh, which would play uh, regulatory roles? And when we do identify such long non-coding RNAs, how do we assess their physiological relevance? And today in particular, I would like to share two stories that exemplify how we have leveraged mouse models of cancer in the pursuit of these questions. Okay, so as an entry point, um, we uh, began by examining long non-coding RNAs in the context of the P53 pathway, uh, which is of course a central tumor suppressor mechanism mutated or inactivated in over 90% of human cancers. So P53 itself is a transcription factor. It binds to motifs called P53 response element in the promoter of target genes to activate their expression and ultimately enact its downstream functions and tumor suppression. And so our goal was to identify and characterize the functions and mechanisms of all P53 regulated long non-coding RNAs, both as a means to determine how long non-coding RNAs may mediate P53 functions, but also to get at the scope of contributions to long non-coding RNAs to cancer more broadly. And so to this end, uh, Efrat Esfaye, a graduate student in my lab, analyzed the P53 transcriptome, and what she found was that P53 binds to about 6,000 sites in the genome to activate uh, a couple of hundred uh, genes, and amongst them, about 20 long non-coding RNAs. And so to investigate the roles of these long non-coding RNAs in the P53 pathway, Efrat decided to use CRISPR uh, to mutate the P53 response element um, in the promoters of each long non-coding RNA as a genetic strategy to inactivate P53 binding site and therefore inhibit P53 dependent expression. And she successfully generated what we call these delta RE alleles uh, for about uh, eight of the, of the 20 long non-coding RNAs she identified. And next, she performed a series of functional assays, including this colony formation assay, under conditions where cells are experiencing uh, the P53 dependent response to stress, and therefore they have suppressed proliferation and low colony forming potential, as seen here in the control cells. And strikingly, she found that um, one of these delta RE mutations, uh, the one uh, in the link 10 promoter, actually increased colony formation significantly, uh, shown here and also quantified here, and therefore partially rescued the PV3-dependent cellular arrest. And so it appeared that link 10 uh, was in fact a functional mediator of P53 network and mutagenesis of its P53, uh, uh, of its associated P53 response element to so just one of the 6,000 sites to which P53 binds was sufficient uh, to abolish some of P53's anti-proliferative functions. And so um, link 10 actually stands for a very interesting long non-coding RNA, uh, PVT1, which stands for plasma cytoma variant translocation 1. And this long non-coding RNA is expressed from the HQ24 locus, uh, a locus known because it contains uh, the, the dominant human oncogene MIC. And the entire locus, including PVT1, is subject to frequent amplifications and translocations uh, in cancer. And actually, PVT1 was one of the first long non coding RNAs to be linked uh, to human cancer, actually to any human disease. And this was discovered all the way back in the 80s, precisely because of its association uh, with MIC. And since then, um, characterization of the frequent genetic and epigenetic alterations of PVT1 have been shown uh, to correlate with enhanced MIC expression. And these findings led researchers to propose uh, that PVT1 plays an oncogenic role in cancer. Now, Cristiano Olivero, a graduate student in the lab, uh, was particularly intrigued by a potential tumor suppressor function of PVT1, given the association of P53 with this locus. And so she analyzed this delta area allele uh, in more detail and confirmed that mutagenesis um, of the P53 response element uh, by CHIP in indeed abolished P53 binding in the locus. Next, what she found was very interesting. She found that while uh, PVT1A, uh, we're now naming this an isoform, which is initiated at exon 1A upstream of the PVT binding site, 
um, was unchanged and it was unchanged either uh, in response to stress uh, in control cells or following the delta ring mutagenesis. An alternative isoform PVT1B, which was initiated immediately downstream of the PVT3 binding site, uh, was both uh, PVT3 responsive, that is, it was upregulated by P53 in response to stress and completely inhibited in the delta RE mutants. And so based on these findings, she concluded that the PVT1 locus uh, was giving rise to two isoforms, one constitutively expressed and one that was stress dependent and regulated by P53. To understand the function of PVT1B, Christiane performed RNA-seq in uh, control and delta RE cells and found that PVT1B loss affected significantly only one gene, uh, the neighboring MYC, and she confirmed that both by RNA and protein analysis, uh, showing that the delta RE mutation was leading to increased MYC expression. And so basically what she was finding that whereas in control cells, the exposure to stress leads to a 30 to 50% drop in MYC levels, uh, this drop is completely rescued uh, when PVT1B is inhibited. So these data and additional mechanistic studies, which we recently reported on, indicated that this uh, PVT1B isoform of the PVT1 long non-coding RNA becomes activated by P53, specifically in the presence of stress, and serves to downregulate MYC levels. We also found that PVT1B, in fact, suppresses MYC at the level of transcription, and it does this by accumulating at the MYC locus, as shown here by the single molecule RNA fish uh, panel, and by uh, locally modulating the transcriptional environment. And notably, um, uh, we have uncovered an exciting new regulatory mechanisms capable of translating an activating signal, in this case uh, from P53, into a local repressive environment. And therefore, our findings expanded our understandings of how long non-coding RNAs can contribute to cancer networks. But to get back to the question of functional significance, in cancer, uh, MYC is a potent oncogene that promotes cellular proliferation and tumor growth, while P53 is a central tumor suppressor, which acts through its targets to uh, stall cellular proliferation and limit tumor growth. And given PVT1B's position at the intersection of these two networks, we queried its role in tumorigenesis in the context of a mouse model of lung cancer. And we used the KRAS uh, mouse model of lung adenocarcinoma uh, crossed to a Cas9 expressing mouse to allow for gene editing. And what makes this KC uh, model powerful is that we can control tumor initiation uh, with Cre and guide RNA expressing lentiviruses, which we deliver intratracheally uh, to infect uh, individual cells in the lung uh, to both initiate tumor genesis while simultaneously editing the same tumor initiating cells in vivo. And so for this experiment, we designed a set of three guide RNAs, a negative control targeting tomato, a positive control uh, targeting uh, P53 open reading frame uh, meant to knock out P53 expression um, and therefore expected to give rise to bigger tumors, or a guide RNA to mutate the P53 response element required for PVT1 p expression. And so histological analysis of tumor-bearing lungs at 16 weeks post-tumor initiation revealed that the loss of both P53 and PVT1B led to bigger tumors compared to controls. But what was really striking about with this data was that when we quantified tumor area, we found that the burden of delta RE animals was comparable uh, to the burden of P53 knockout animals. And this finding was confirmed with an independent uh, cohort of KC animals, but was not observed in a co cohort of KPC animals. In this case, P stands for a, a genetic deletion of P53 in the tumors. And the fact that the delta RE did not have an additive effect shows that PVT1B indeed acts downstream of P53. And so this finding suggested a really unanticipated key role for PVT1B as the factor responsible for suppressing tumor growth and size downstream of P53, at least in the context of this model, um, which uh, represents relatively low-grade early stages of tumor development. 
Accordingly, loss of PBT1B actually does not lead to more aggressive tumors um, as is commonly seen in the PV3, uh, with PV3 deficiency. And so we can conclude that the functions of PV3 in restraining tumor progression are PVT1B independent. On the other hand, the increased tumor size in delta re animals can be explained by increased cellular proliferation um, as detected uh, by uh, phosphohistone H3 mitotic marker. Okay, so to sum up, our data reveal that P53 activation by stress uh, generally leads to transcriptional activation. But in the case of PVT1B, this is translated into a local repressive signal that downregulates MIC expression mildly, but nonetheless uh, uh, functionally to limit a cellular proliferation. And so going forward, we're thinking how we might use this information to modulate cancer networks therapeutically, including MIC, and therefore some of our current efforts are centered to understanding the functional elements of PVT1B, as well as other uh, local regulatory well-known coding RNAs. Okay, so now switching gears in the second part of my talk, I would like to tell you about a developing story which illustrates how we're thinking of expanding our work. So Elena Martinez, a postdoc in the lab, joined my group with a very strong interest in developing tools and models to study long non-coding RNAs in vivo. And one of the uh, first long non-coding RNAs she focused on was MALAT1. Uh, which stands for metastasis associated to lung adenocarcinoma transcript 1. Basically, a long non coding RNA that is overexpressed in advanced stages of lung cancer and is associated with poor prognosis. In addition to lung adenocarcinoma, I should mention that uh, studies since its original discovery have shown that it's also. Um, uh, uh, dysregulated in many other cancer types, uh, including metastatic breast cancer. And despite years of work, uh, the normal as well as pathological functions of MALAT1 have remained unknown, um, and knockout models um, have led to conflicting results about the role of MALAT1 in cancer. And so first, working with David Rim and the Yale Pathology and Tissue Services, Elena used RNA scope uh, on tissue microarrays to confirm that while MALAT1 is ubiquit ubiquitously expressed across um, cells and tissues, uh, shown here is normal lung, it uh, does uh, show elevated levels in lung adenocarcinoma samples, um, show examples shown here and scored here. Uh, you can see the significant, statistically significant difference. And importantly, uh, consistent with previous studies, uh, from the Yale uh, cohort, we could show that elevated levels of MALAT1 significantly correlated with poor prognosis, and showing here this decreased uh, disease-free survival in patients with high MALAT1 levels. Next, she decided to develop innovative approaches to test um, whether overexpression of MALAT1 was the cause or a mere consequence of aggressive disease. And so Elena's goal was rather than deleting MALAT1, which had been previously done and which would be in fact the opposite of what happens in human cancer, she would induce transcriptional changes of MALAT1 to really reflect the epigenetic alterations observed in MALAT1 in human cancer. And so in order to activate MALAT1, um, she chose to use the CRISPR-SAM system in which um, uh, one uses a short guide RNA called the DRNA, uh, which does not support uh, DNA cleavage, but nonetheless uh, can serve as a recruitment platform for Cas9. And this DRNA is also fused to the MS2 hairpins in order to recruit um, uh, a, a fusion of, uh, uh, of the transcriptional activators, HSF1 and P65, fused to the MS2 binding protein. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, the DRNA can be designed against any uh, promoter of interest, in our case, MALAT1. And conversely, she selected uh, CRISPR inactivation using the repressive CRAB fusion construct to ask whether inhibition of MALAT1 might have a therapeutic benefit. 
And so as shown here, uh, using um, uh, uh, the, this H23 and H2009 uh, uh, KRAS mutant P53 deficient human uh, lung adenocarcinoma cell line, Elena was successful in both um, upregulating MAWAT1 by CRISPR-A uh, and, and downregulating its expression by CRISPR-I. Interestingly, neither CRISPR-A or CRISPR-I alter the growth rate of these cell lines, um, suggesting that MAWAT1 did not appear to regulate cellular proliferation. On the other hand, Elena found that CRISPR activation led to increased wound healing in scratch assays, whereas CRISPR inactivation resulted in decreased wound healing, suggesting a role for MAWAT1 in promoting migration and invasion, which is also consistent with previous findings, which had identified as a metastasis-associated gene. Okay, but the ultimate goal was to determine the role of MAWAT1 at the organismal level. And so to adapt the SAM system in vivo, Elena started with the KRAS uh, P53 conditional uh, uh, mouse model of non-small cell lung cancer uh, uh, cross to Cas9, which I introduced earlier. But now she initiated tumor genesis with a lentiviral construct, which co-expresses CRE, the targeting uh, dead RNA fused to the MS2 uh, uh, hairpins, as well as the transcriptional activator's fusion construct. And here uh, she sacrificed a mouse cohort at the 16 weeks post-tumor initiation. And the preliminary results uh, are striking. Even grossly, it's clear that MAWAT1 overexpression is a driver of tumor genesis. And we now have the perfect model to rec recapitulate the events in human cancer and to dissect the molecular and cellular basis for the role of MAWAT1 uh, in tumor genesis. And so I'll end here. Um, what I've shown you today is how we're adapting CRISPR technologies in the context of mouse models to investigate long non-coding RNAs in innovative ways and get at their functional significance in vivo. And these approaches have led us to conclude that PVT1B and MAWAT1 long non-coding RNAs um, uh, are, play causative roles, not simply correlative roles in tumorigenesis. We found that PVT1B is a tumor suppressor, isoform that limits cellular proliferation, both during stress and in tumorigenesis, whereas MAWAT1 overexpression drives aggressive phenotypes such as migration and invasion and more aggressive tumor growth. And importantly, um, our models allow us to study these long non coding RNAs in vivo at the organismal level and therefore pave the way for us to understand their contributions to human cancer and perhaps even to design therapeutic strategies to target them. And so we'd like, uh, with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge the members of my lab uh, who performed this work, uh, as well as thank our collaborators uh, and funding sources, and I would be happy to take questions. Aja, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, I know we're a little late on time, but let me, uh, let me start by uh, asking a question, which is, um, I think you, you obviously alluded to the fact that this potentially could be an avenue towards therapeutics. And curious, you know, you probably thought quite a bit about that. How would you approach it? So um, what one strategy that has emerged in recent years is the use of antisense oligonucleotides to target um, long non-coding RNAs in vivo. And this, there is the first, ASO approved uh, uh, by the FDA to target um, uh, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. But what could see how this technology could potentially be uh, expanded down the line to target long non coding RNAs? And the advantage there is that these antisense oligonucleotides, all you need to know is to identify a sequence to either target and therefore degrade the long non coding RNA or if you don't want to degrade the long non-coding RNA, you could use non-targeting ASOs to perhaps bind to a portion of the RNA that has the function um, and perhaps inhibit even a specific downstream function. Um, to get to all that, you actually need to understand in specific detail the mechanism of long non-coding RNAs. And that's where um, we're focusing a large part of the work in the lab. Um, and developing a wide array of really innovative approaches to study that, uh, because that's where the field needs to grow. But 
five years from now, I think this won't sound like science fiction anymore. I think it will become a reality. Yes, thank you. Well, I know we're, we're out of time. It's a couple of minutes after the hour. I, I want to thank Nadja and Brenda for two really superb presentations and an outstanding body of work. And thank all of you for joining today. And I look forward to uh, hearing more about uh, the work in both of your laboratories. So uh, thanks, everybody, and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.